So thanks a lot for the invitation to this uh, conference. As you can see, I'm a mathematician. I'm working in a math institute, and I would like to present some uh, recent ways of deriving effective equations for many particle systems. I put this word derivation here in quotation marks for one reason. I, I have to say I don't like this word with this, uh, in, in this uh, context. Um, the point is when mathematicians talk about deriving an equation, they not really mean to derive the equation, they mean to prove the validity of this equation with mathematical rigor. So they do the mathematical rigorous part of an equation which has been derived by physicists many years ago. And I use this word here because that's the way mathemat mathematicians like to talk about it. So if you read an article or some colleague tells you I have derived some equation and he's a mathematician uh, to avoid misunderstandings, well, I also use it because that's the common language, although another word would be better. I would like to start with the motivation, and I'm interested in uh, systems of uh, many particles, and in particular of the dynamics of such many particle systems, in particular when there's interaction between the particles. And for many cases, you know, you're the experts, it's uh, difficult to have some analytical or numerical uh, result for that. So if you really, for example, start with the many body Schrödinger equation, and really want to simulate the Schrödinger equation, not some approximation, the true Schrödinger equation with an interaction term. This is numerically uh, often impossible when you have a few particles. So in the quantum mechanical situation, if the particle number is, let's say, 10 or larger, and you have all kinds of correlations between the particles, this is usually hopeless. And what you do as physicists, I heard that already in a talk today, you use some kind of simplified effective description. You replace the true interaction by some kind of effective, for example, mean field uh, equation, and this is what you do. And now, what is a very active field now in mathematical physics is to prove the validity of such effective description. So you start with these uh, effective equations and you prove rigorously that they are really close to the true situation where you look at the true microscopic uh, equations of motion, and what is particularly interesting, of course, is the interaction. When there's no interaction, it's usually easy to do. When you have independent motion of the end particles, there's not a lot to discuss, but when you have interaction between the particles, this is interesting. As I told before, I'm interested in the dynamical questions also in this talk. In particular, for quantum situations, you could also ask static a question. You could ask the question, how does the ground state look like for a system of n particles with interaction and ask about the ground state. So this is a static question. This is also not easy to do. There, one also uses effective uh, descriptions. Uh, but here, I'm interested in the dynamics. I want to mention a few examples where such things might be interesting. These are all examples we uh, do research on in my group, uh, in, with my group in Munich. For example, you could say you want to derive the Hartree-Fock equation to describe the dynamics of large molecules. When chemists describe the dynamics of large molecules with the computer numerically, they always use Hartree or Hartree-Fock. But the true description is, of course, the n-body Schrödinger equation with pair interaction or the more fundamental description. And, of course, it would be interesting to start from there. In cold Bose gases, there's many results in the mathematical literature. You can derive Hartree or physically even more important, the so-called gross pietersky equation. You might have heard about this gross pietersky equation. It's not really a mean field equation, I would say. It's, the point is to derive, if you make a mean field ansatz, you arrive at some gross pietersky equation with the wrong coupling constant compared to what you see in the experiment. And in fact, there's pair correlations between the particles. So the particles, usually uh, it describes the physics of a dilute Bose gas at condensation. And the particles, since the gas is dilute, don't uh, hit so often. But when they hit, the collisions are uh, comparably hard. And you have some pair correlations. You have to consider the correlation with the next nearest neighbor, so to say, to get the right coupling constant out. So it's not really a mean field situation, although many people claim it would be. And there's, if you do it rigorously, of course, you have to really consider these pair correlations. And this is something that's, that's many results. Well, just one 
Note, uh, the, for, also the effective equation for fermions are so important, there's very few mathematical results. So comparing to bosons, boson there's a lot understood. Fermions are mathematically here very hard to handle. What we also did, we derived Maxwell's equation from some QED model. As you, it's some kind of semi-classical limit, so to say. You know, you should describe uh, also uh, electromagnetic effects in, with, with photons. And uh, this is not so easy to do, of course. If you have classical behavior, it's clear that the Maxwell's equation come out because these are the Heisenberg's equation. But to really show that there's classical behavior, it's not easy to do. And what you can do is if you go to a many-body system, it is known that if the photons are in a coherent state, they react classically on the system. But what is the mathematically challenging part is to show that the photons which are naturally created by a system are close to a coherent state. They will never be exact in a coherent state. A coherent state is an idealization. So what you want to do is you start with a gas of charged particles. You show that as time evolves, the photons created are in some sense close to a coherent state. And then you show that this closeness is sufficient to have a classical behavior as a back reaction on the charges. And this is something uh, which you can do. So you can also read the Maxwell's equation as some effective description for QED in a certain situation, of course, where they hold. Today, I would like to focus on something one could call the most obvious system or something which has been discussed for a long time. Most obvious in the sense this might be the first physical system you heard about in school. It's just a Newtonian particles with interaction. This is a conference on long-range interaction, and uh, therefore I would like to exclude collisions. So collisions are very hard to, to treat with mathematical rigor. So we really think of uh, point, particles which interact on a longer range. So I would like to introduce now the notation I will use before I say a little bit more about the technicalities and, and what people prove here. So, we have n interacting particles, as I said, for example, stars in Newtonian dynamics. So this uh, equation, which I would like to derive now, derive, is uh, important for the dynamics of galaxies or plasmas. So when I talk about particles, you could have the electrons in some plasma in, in, in mind, for example, in some fusion reactor, you want to describe the plasma. You don't describe the motion of all the electrons, but you describe the cloud somehow. Or what you can also have in mind, you can think of about stellar dynamics. You have a galaxy formed as stars. You go to a regime where, where relativistic effects are not so relevant, and you describe the motion of the cloud of stars here. I learned recently that it's even more interesting if the points are galaxies, and you go to structures which are even, even beyond the galaxy structure. But I will talk, in, the, in, in this talk, I will always refer to stars. So our points are some stars in some kind of a galaxy. They move. We assume that it's a good approximation to do Newtonian dynamics. And by gravity, you have pair interaction. But remember, the system might be interesting in other situations. And uh, I describe it by some trajectory in phase space. So this is the notation I will use. Q for the position, P for the momentum. I will set the masses to be equal to 1, so P and is the same as the velocity, so Q is position, P velocity, and I have n particles, and Qj is the position of particle number j, Pj is the momentum, or the speed of particle j. Newtonian dynamics, this, you know the time derivative of Q is given by the velocity, and the time derivative of the velocity if given, given by the force acting on the system. We could introduce an external force. This would not cause any technical problems. But at the moment, I just assume that I have an interaction force. So the force between the two particles is given by this pair interaction here. So here I have the force between Qj and Q, Q, Qk. And I want to look at the situation where the force is of order one in my scaling. So I have the following picture. I have a box of fixed volume, and I put more and more stars into this box. And I look about at the interaction, which uh, is such that the interaction strength keeps constant. And this I can make sure by this prefactor into the minus one, which cancels the summation. You might say this looks unphysical. Well, 
it looks, but it is not, because you can say, well, it's just a rescaling of the true situation. If you say, okay, I will have a volume which increases with the particle number proportional to the particle number, and you rescale space and time in the respective way, you can get rid of this prefactor and have a system which makes more sense, because of, in physics, it, it doesn't make so much sense to change the interaction behavior, the coupling with the particle number, but as I said, this is just a rescaling, so it can be physically argued for. And now I want to derive a macroscopic uh, law of motion. Yeah, for what is always the question, which is the macroscopic object you want to describe? Well, I would like to describe the particle density. And how I do this, there I give now a picture, which might be very easy, but I think it's good to have pictures to keep in mind, and this will be relevant for later, because I will now form the galaxy. So this uh, I will use later. I will, let's think we have some empty space. We play God, so to say. We take the stars and throw them into this empty space, forming a galaxy. And what I will assume is that I throw in these stars in an IID way. So in an, I have an initial uh, probability density rho zero, so nice and smooth probability density on the one particle uh, uh, phase space, and I throw in the particles in an IID way. So my first particle from my first star will sit on a certain position, Q1, P1, the second somewhere else, and then as time goes on, I form this galaxy with stars sitting in certain position. And now what is the density? Well, the density, to discuss about the density, you can say, let's take a volume V, which is an, on, an, on an intermediate scale, so the volume is small compared to the volume of my full galaxy, but still large enough that it contains many stars. So the number of stars will be very large, and V will contain many stars, but still be small. And then you can move this V around, and then you get this uh, density. And now I would like to show what is the time evolution of the system. So now if I look at this, I can say, well, I want to guess the force which is felt on the position Q. So let's assume there's a star, I painted it in red here, sitting on the position Q, and I want to know what is the force this uh, guy experiences. But first of all, of course, I have this coupling constant, n to the minus 1, which was my coupling constant, and then I have the sum over all these boxes, so I take j is the label for the different boxes, and I take the force coming from all the particles or all the stars in one box times the number of stars which there are in this box, and I get this simple formula. Well, using my definition of this density, of course, the density is defined by the number of particles in the box divided by V times the total number of particles. This is the definition of the density. And if I plug that in, well, this is not working anymore, so I go here. If I use that, you get this formula. And this formula can be approximated by an integral. So I have this volume element Vj, and you can write from the sum times the volume into integral, it turns to an integral over this volume here. This, remember, this volume is a volume in phase space. It's a six-dimensional volume, and I arrive at this formula. This here is in good approximation. You can read this, uh, well, this is a good approximation because it's the respective Riemann sum, and this here I use the notation, this is a covolution, the Q variable. If you look at this, you integrate out P, and then you make a covolution in Q. So you have Q minus QJ, not P minus PJ, you only have the Q minus QJ. So you make a covolution in Q and an integral in P, and this is the notation I use. So we have guessed now this uh, kind of formula for the system, and here it's very important to note that one argument which I used here is the law of large numbers argument. Why is it included here? Well, I had a probability density rho which was given initially, and I threw the particles in an IID way into my cloud. And now the law of large numbers argument tells us that the empirical density, so the density which is empirically there, which describes where my particles are sitting, is close to this probability density. I think this is very important because conceptually these are very, very different things than empirical density and the probability density. Also, the formula is the same because of law of large numbers, so here the 
rho turns into empirical densities, therefore there's really a force acting on the star which is there, and it's not only it's an ex expectation value of a force which could be larger or smaller and just in mean hit the right thing. No, it's really the force which there is, uh, uh, which, we, which we have estimated here. Now, of course, the system is dynamical. With the motion of the particles, also my rho uh, changes. But as you know, so this uh, row will be time dependent because of the motion of my, my stars here. But you have conservation of phase space volume, this you all know. So if you move with one of these boxes, the number of particles which remain in our box will be a constant. And therefore what you get is that if you estimate your row along such a trajectory, so follow the trajectory of the particle sitting in the center of the box. This will be constant because little n is now a constant and large n and v are constants anyway. Which means that the time derivative of this guy is zero and you arrive at the respective continuity equations so of the partial derivative plus uh, the spatial derivative times q dot plus the uh, velocity derivative times p dot is equal to zero. And now we know what we did before. We said, well, this p dot comes from this force, and I have a good approximation now for this force. And this I can plug in. So here I have this f bar. And if you remember what I got for this f bar, I get this equation. So what we have here is now the so-called Vlasov equation, guessing it heuristically. So therefore, well, there was no rigor mathematics. It was just like a physicist would do it, right? This is the way you would have done it. Uh, and th later I would like to talk about a rigorous proof. Can you really show with mathematical rigor that this describes the situation? Before I do that, I would like to mention the following. This is a nonlinear equation. The rho appears in a nonlinear way here. Rho times something which depends on rho. And this comes from the fact that I have this many body system <clears throat> and that this density turned into an empirical density. There's also nonlinear Schrödinger equations where you have some nonlinear term. And sometimes people use them if you only have a few particles. So you have to assume you have a nonlinear Schrödinger equation. So the interaction term is nonlinear. So you have an interaction rho times uh, in convolution with some v. This is a very strange thing because you have a probability density in convolution with some potential. So you have. Uh, you look, you, it seems like you think there's an interaction, although there's only the possibility that there might be a particle. And if you only have a few particles, uh, the, such equations do not make sense. Uh, or let's say they cannot be explained for or derived from the linear uh, uh, microscopic system. But here it's a little bit different because here you should understand I am in the many-body system, so my probability density is not only a probability density, it's now an empirical density. It's a density of particles which are really sitting there. And now to say from them I have this interaction makes perfect sense. Okay, I have this uh, Vlasov equation, and what I would like to do next is I would like to talk about some mathematical results. And this Vlasov equation, as I said, it's a very active field in mathematical physics to derive effective equations. And this Vlasov equation was discussed already in the 70s. There's rigorous results where this, it's really proven that the true density, if you follow the Newtonian dynamics with pan interaction, is close to the solution of the Vlasov equation. I would like to say a few words about the sense of closeness in a second. Going back from, to the 70s. Yep. I mentioned two important results, and there has been many similar results uh, until today. And the problem now is, as you can see, that they assume that F is globally Lipschitz. So the interaction force is globally Lipschitz, and particularly bounded. But as I said in the beginning, the interesting physical cases are plasmas or s galaxies, and there you have Coulomb interaction. Repulsive or attractive, so gravitation or repulsive Coulomb. And that's, of course, not included in these papers. What they do is, typically, well, there's also some other approaches, but in the most, uh, well, uh, the, the, the way which is done uh, very often is 
that you understand this trajectory x as a density. Remember what I said. So I have the one, the microscopic system. The microscopic system is described by a trajectory x, large x, consisting of q and p, the trajectory and phase space. The effective description is now an evolution equation for a density. These are completely different objects, a trajectory and a density. And before I be able to compare them, I have to bring them on the same level. And one way of bringing them to the same level is to say, OK, I translate my trajectory into a density by looking at this object. I take the sum over all these data functions. So then I have the data functions on the positions where the particles are. Then it's a density. And what the people do is they show some deterministic result. I will say something about the word deterministic soon. They will show that if initially at time zero, my empirical density, so the sum of deltas, is close to my row zero, then this holds also at time t. Whereas this, here I have the Newtonian dynamics of, of this trajectory x and build the empirical density at this later time. And here I have row zero to row t. This is the solution of this Vlasov equation, which I have guessed heuristically. Deterministic means here now what they do is they can show when if ever this is close, then this is close no matter what. And I will give a probabilistic result later. I will show that this is not true always, but with very high probability, the details will come next. Therefore, I call this a deterministic result. Of course, the closeness, for those who have some mathematical training, it's not in L1, of course. The one function is the sum of deltas, the other is smooth. No, it's a closeness in the sense of yeah, some observables. You have some nice and smooth function on phase space. You use this as an observable, and then you compare the smooth density to the, the sum of deltas. And then, of course, it makes sense to have some closeness, some matching. And this is what one does here. Mathematicians call that. Uh, Wasserstein distance, but this is something which is for you very easy to understand, but I'm not writing it here because this is not what I will do later in the talk. Now, as I said, the interesting cases are Coulomb. And there, you have, of course, the force is Q over Q3, so I dropped the coupling constant. You know, we mathematicians set all the factors always equal to 1 to have, less, have some ease of writing. So the coupling will just be some constant. And there was now a recent result. And if you look at that, so it started in 74. And the next really, I would say, interesting step forward to get closer to Coulomb was 40 years later. And this is a result by Ure and Jabin. And what they consider, they do not consider the Coulomb case. So they take a singularity which is a little bit weaker. They have this minus delta here. Delta they can show for any positive delta, they can handle these potentials. So it's slightly weaker than Coulomb. And they need a cutoff at n to the minus 6, 1, 6. Why well, I have the explanation what a cutoff is here, but you all know that, so I don't have to say anything here. And this is what they do. And I would like to mention here at this point that doing the rigorous derivation of the Vlasov equation for the full Coulomb singularity without any cutoff, this is still an open problem until today. And I think it uh, would be very nice to get closer to that. And this is now what I will do later in this talk to show you how one can improve these things. What they do, and this is now, I said the other stuff was deterministic. This is now probabilistic in some sense. Now what Ure and Jabin do, they exclude some particular initial conditions. So there are some initial conditions where they say they don't get uh, this, uh, this, this result here. But they can show that these initial conditions are untypical. Untypical means they have small probability. Remember the picture I had at the beginning. I form my galaxy throwing in stars in an IID way. So I get a probability measure. And with respect to this probability measure, the initial condition they exclude have small probability. So it's still a very nice result. Now, you could say, well, it could be, there's always, if you do rigorous stuff, the question, is this condition really needed, or is it just technical? A technical condition is something where it's just in fact, you don't need the condition, but without the condition, it's just too hard to prove something. The statement is still true, but you don't know how to prove it. This is a technical thing. 
And it could be that this is technical, but I can show you now an argument that it's not technical, that in general, this is wrong. Which also means that this additional uh, assumption they have, that they exclude some, some things, that this is not bad, so it looks like a weaker result, but in fact, it's, it's not the case, because the stronger result, if you would just say, okay, assume that this holds for this interaction, it's wrong. And I will give you the argument. And the argument is as follows. Consider the repulsive case. So the argument works best in the repulsive case. You have a repulsive system, and you take your n particles, which you have, let's say, n electrons, and you form clusters. In each cluster, there's epsilon times n particles, and the number of clusters is epsilon to the minus 1. n will be extremely large, and epsilon will be small, such that epsilon n will still be very, very, very large. This is the idea which you have. And now you form these clusters. Since you still have many clusters, namely epsilon to the minus n, if you look at it from far away with the, with the blurred lens, so to say, you still see a nice and smooth density. So it still converges in some weak sense, in some, uh, if you look at observables, against the smooth rho zero. So you still have initial convergence. But now if you look at the time evolution of the system, what happens? Well, <clears throat> I have many, many particles in the cluster, almost of order n, so this n to the minus 1 prefactor from the coupling is cancelled, uh, only the epsilon is left. But I have the singular behavior, so if the singularity is such that the cluster is so that I'm so close, the particles are so close to, the, to each other, that the singularity is stronger than this, uh, this factor epsilon, then the potential energy for the particles will be very large. So what I will have here, I can find by tuning the value for epsilon, I find a situation where the cluster is such that the potential energy of all these particles is very large. And what will happen now is very clear. So these clusters, they will explode. The particles, in particular those on the edge, they will uh, be propelled away from the center, and after some time the system will look like this. You will have particles which are very fast, move in all kinds of direction, they will go out very fast and will not be described by this nice Vlasov equation which gently evolves in phase space, so it's clear that for such a situation uh, things turn out bad. But now remember, I said it's small in probability to form these clusters, of course, in an IID way, if you throw in your particles IID, to have these very close clusters is very imp improbable, so uh, it's in line with what I said before. Now, what I want to tell you next now in the, next, uh, in the remaining, five minutes, remaining five minutes is about another approach which I have found with my students. And what we do is we start in a different way. We, again, you remember I have to control a trajectory with a density. And what usually people do is they uh, uh, translate x into a density. I do the other way around. The idea is to bring rho to the level of trajectories. And I would like to explain you how one can do that. I assume that the Vlasov equation has some solution. So I started again. I have this row zero. I form my galaxy. And the first thing I do is, before looking at the trajectories, I solve the Vlasov equation. And this solution now is given. Given this solution, I now define a, an auxiliary system in the following way. Again, it's a Newtonian system. Q dot is given by P p dot by some force, but this time I don't use the pair interaction force, no. I assume for each particle that each particle feels this force which I have guessed initially. And now the good thing is here, I start of course with the same initial condition as in my true system. And what the goal is now to prove that my true and my auxiliary system match, that q and q bar and p and p bar are always close. There's one very important thing which I would like to note. Here I don't have pair interaction. I have, this is like an external field. So the independence I had initially is not lost as time evolves. This is the big advantage. And now the goal is to compare Q and P. So next I would like to mention the results which we have. This was one of my students. Um, we look at, we first started also with a force which is slightly weaker than Coulomb, but the cutoff is much better. It's n to the minus one third compared to n to the minus one six. This is interesting because n to the minus one third is the distance to the next neighbor. 
in average, right? You have a volume of order one. The next neighbor has uh, typically the distance n to the minus one third. We could improve this result and shift, so to say, the delta to, to there. So we could look at the true Coulomb force with the price we had to pay is we had to uh, make the cutoff a little bit worse, but, but it's, it's interesting because it's the Coulomb. I would like to talk only about the first thing because it's a little bit easier to explain. Now remember these QJs, the initial positions and momenta of IID, though I get some probability measure on the phase space. My random object is this initial, initial uh, situation, so this large x0 is that what you usually know as little omega, and I have a product uh, measure on this space. Now, these q's, they are functions of the initial uh, situation, so given x0, q's, the q's and p's can be, can be determined, so they are random variables. And now the interesting thing is for my auxiliary system, which I have introduced, is independence is not lost, and the probability density is just transported by the Vlasov flow after some time t, the probability density if given by the solution of Vlasov. And now what the law of large numbers argument tells us now, since after t I still have law of large numbers, that my q bar p bar system, they will, that will always converge against rho. This is just law of large numbers, the direct application. So all I have to show is that my true system is close to this auxiliary system. Then I know that also my true system describes the solution of Lasov. Now comes the part which is a little bit more technical. Now this is like an ansatz. I will introduce now a few objects which might look strange. And on the next slide, I will explain you the advantage of these objects and why I use them. So this is now the set I'm looking at. This is the set of bad trajectories. A trajectory is bad when the deviation of the true and this auxiliary solution is larger than n to the minus one third. You might still say, well, n to the minus one third, this is not very much. Well, I'm saying my, I have high standards here at the moment, and I will tell you why these high standards are, in fact, helpful. So we have very high standards. We already call something bad if only one particle, here I have the maximum norm. So if only one of the particles deviates more than n to the minus one third, then I say, well, this trajectory is bad already. And what we prove as a theorem is we show that for any t, if I take the limit n to infinity, the particle number n to infinity, that the probability to have a bad trajectory is equal to zero in this limit. And I, we can also do, well, very often when mathematicians make these derivations, they have results like that. But I think it's very important to get error estimates to really be able to talk to physicists, then I can give the error estimate, which is also striking. The error estimate, so this probability is bounded by C gamma n minus gamma for any gamma. For, so for any gamma you give me, I can find a C gamma that this probability is bounded by that. So it goes down faster than any polynomial. What do I do? How do I prove that? And I would like to give you just a few arguments how this is done. I define this. Other random variable, it's again this distance between true and auxiliary trajectories multiplied by n to the one third, but I cut off this value if it's one. So if this gets larger than one, I just keep the value one. Which means that this j is, can, is one if and only if my, my, my w my, is in this at. So if, if, if I'm in the set at, only if I'm in the set at, then this value is equal to 1. And then what I will prove, and I will give you some ideas how to prove it on the final slide, I will prove that the time derivative of the expectation value of j is bounded by the expectation value of j plus something which is small as n tends to infinity. If I have this, most of you might know Grünwald lemma, then by Grünwald you find this uh, equation, and of course this expectation value at time zero is equal to zero because initially both things matched. And since J is positive, you can show that the probability to be in A is bounded by the expectation. This comes from this fact. You get the value one whenever you're in A. When you're not in A, you get something positive. So the expectation value is larger than the probability to be in A. And therefore, if I can control E, 
then I can show that my theorem holds. Now, this is the last slide. I would uh, I recall here this N. And I would like to explain you why we use this J and what are the advantages. So this will not be technical. I just heuristically explain the advantages. And the point is, you could say, well, why not just do the following? Just take this probability to be an A, P of A, and try to find a Grünwald inequality for that. So look at the time derivative of P of A and so on. Well, the argument is the following. An expectation value is easier to control. Why? The expectation value of the characteristic function of A is the same as the probability of A that you know. Remember, our A was this set, this set, this, this set here. And the point is, if you look at this now, this J is like a characteristic function. Whenever I'm in the set A, I get the value 1. But outside A, I'm not putting it to 0. No, I smoothly go up to 1. So I have something like a smoothed out probability to be in A. This, of course, has advantages. If you look at the time derivative, and some, if you have a characteristic function, so the probability and the trajectory goes down from 1 to 0 all of a sudden, this is, of course, bad to control. But if the value goes down gently, and this is what my J does, it's much easier to handle. And from the technical view, you might uh, believe me that this is very, very helpful. So this j has reached its maximum whenever this is equal to n to the minus one third. It cannot grow anymore. And remember, I wanted to prove some Grünwald estimate. I wanted to estimate the time derivative of the expectation value of j. Well, when I have reached the maximum, I cannot grow any further. I can only go down. And I wanted to have a bound from above, which means when my trajectory is bad already, I don't care anymore what happens in the future. It, I just assume, well, it stays bad and to take the value 1. But the, the time derivative of the expectation value, which measures the badness, can only be negative. It can only get better. Therefore, I do not need to consider these cases. The estimates for those cases are trivial. There, the time derivative is negative. I get a trivial upper bound. And this is, of course, now related to what I said at the beginning. Somehow, I have to exclude this clustering. And now remember this picture with the clusters. How do I exclude it? Now, I look at my auxiliary system, the Q-bar, P-bar system. There I can do law of large numbers argument. So these clusters, they, their probability is so small that you can forget about them. So for the auxiliary system, there's no clustering. Now my true system, I only have to consider cases where my Q-bar, P-bar, and Q-P are cl close to each other. All the other cases are not interesting. And now I give you the following exercise. Take a Q bar P bar, which is nice and smooth, yeah, particles, no clustering. And now you may shift each particle by n to the minus one third and try to form a cluster. Of course, that doesn't work. So no matter what you do, you can really exclude clustering rigorously using the law of large numbers argument on Q bar P bar only, where you can use it and argue there's no clustering, and then do the technical stuff, and you have excluded all the bad systems. So I wanted to give an outlook, but I think I skipped that because uh, time is over. And I would like to thank you for the attention. And